Well, how about a good morning? Good to see you. For those of you who joined us online, I'm so glad that you're willing to share your time with us like this. And man, for those of you who are sitting here in the congregation, I'm so tickled to see you. And every week I can see that we've got folks trickling in, trickling in, coming back. And we're glad to have you. And this morning, I want to share a, a principle, a lesson with you that's going to help you be a better influence on others. But it's also going to help others be a better influence on you. You ask, Ronnie, where have you found this principle? Why well, I found it in a story in the Bible. A story that's recorded in the Old Testament book of Numbers. Chapter 13 and 14, we're going to read together in just a moment. Before we do, let me set the stage and tell you what's going on. The Israelites had been held in captivity in Egypt for about 400 years. The latter portion of that time was miserable. And in their misery, the Israelites begged God for deliverance, and He answered their prayer, and He delivered them. Uh, under the leadership of two brothers, Moses and Aaron, God began to lead his people through a wilderness. It was harsh, it was challenging, it was a time of great testing, but they made it. They ended up at a place called Kadesh Barnea, and they were just steps away from going in and claiming a land that God was giving to them. Uh, and I guess, just to be exact, technically correct, he had already given them this land. But while they were in captivity, others had taken the land and were living in it. And so one of the first things they had to do was enter the land, conquer the land before they could settle the land. And so when they came to this place called Kadesh Barnea, God told Moses, pick a leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel and which, of course, let me, let, me, let me wow you with my mathematic skills. That would be 12, the team of 12. And so he, God said, send them into the land as spies. And they're going to go in and they're going to gather some data. And so Moses picked 12 leaders. He called them around him and said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go in the land before we do. And you've got a, you're going on a reconnaissance mission, a fact-finding mission. Go in there and find out what the soil is like. Is it poor? Is it fertile? What's the land like? You've got a lot of trees. Is it open country? If you could, maybe you could bring us back some samples of the fruit. Oh, yeah, while you're in there, uh, find out what the people are like. Are they weak or strong? Do they live in open villages, or are they living behind fortified walls? We need to know all this. And apparently, they were going to take all this information, and they were going to, put, they were going to choose the best route to go in and to choose cities that were the most vulnerable, a good place to begin if you're going to conquer the land. So the 12 guys go in. They spend 40 days in there. They come back, they got a meeting with Moses and Aaron, and apparently this became public knowledge. They, in the meeting, they're going to share the results of their, uh, their expedition. But also, a lot of the Israelites gathered around. Kind of, they, had, they had a lot at stake. They were very interested in what these men had found and what they had to share. And so one of the guys spoke on behalf of the twelve, and he said, just got to tell you this, the land is fabulous. It is a wonderful land. It's Everything God said it would be, a land flowing with milk and honey, incredibly fertile. Uh, for folks like us who make our living with agriculture, it couldn't be more perfect. As a matter of fact, we got samples of the fruit. And they had picked one cluster of grapes. And get this, the cluster of grapes was so big, so heavy, that it had to be attached to a pole. And two men carried it on a pole. Can you get this? So you just imagine, now you're one of the Israelites and you've been... Released from bondage, you've successfully, safely made it through a wilderness. you got to be starting to feel pretty good about things, right? 
I mean, things are really looking up. If we set, once we conquer and sell this land, our children, our children's children, you know, their future is just set. So everybody's got to be really optimistic. Then all of a sudden, this guy puts a little spin on the report. And I want us to read it together. In, 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 excuse me, Numbers chapter 13, verse number 28. Look what he said. But, you see that? C carefully inserted three-letter conjunction. But, now the whole tone of his report is about to change. He said, but the people living there are powerful. And their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites, they're down in the Negev. That was a region of this land. The Amalekites are down there. They've already, had, they've already had a confrontation with them. They knew they were bad. And the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites, well, they're living in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan River Valley. But all of a sudden, look at this. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land. He said, we can, those are two critical words. You see those, we can certainly conquer it. And he said it emphatically. Well, okay, what's going on here? Now, the gentleman who started the report was representing himself and nine of the other spies. Ten of them were in agreement on this. But he's not completely representing two of the spies. One of them is the gentleman who just spoke up, Caleb, and he's got a good friend named Joshua. They saw things a little differently. Now, Caleb recognizes what's going on, and he feels like he needs to counter what is happening. Uh, he sees that these ten guys are apparently going to try to discourage the people from going into the land and taking it. You could feel it in his presentation, in the things they were saying. You could feel what they were attempting to do. And Caleb and Joshua agreed together, no, 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 we, they, we can't do that. So Caleb spoke up. And he begins to quieten the people, which tells me they're starting to murmur. They're starting to mutter. They're, they're, they're beginning to kind of voice their discontent to one another like, oh, no, I, you know, I knew it was too good to be true. Caleb steps up and tries to quieten them, and he tries to counter this discouragement with encouragement. He said, guys, we can do this. Oh, look what the, guys, the other guy said. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. Look at this. We can't. And Caleb said, we can. These guys said, we can't. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. What report? Well, he shares it with us. This is what they started telling everybody. Isn't it amazing how bad news travels so fast? Huh? <laughs> He said, the land we traveled through and explored will, not maybe, not might, could, but will, devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people, now really, that's an exaggeration. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of a gnat. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. What he's saying is, you know, as we looked at them and how big they were, we thought, you know, they could squash us like bugs. And that's what they were thinking, too. How would they know what those people were thinking? So here's the report they spread. This is a rotten idea. This is not going to work. To continue following God and his men into this land is in essence suicidal. We'll all be killed. That's the way the story will end. Not with us winning battle after battle and conquering the land and settling the land and passing it on to generation after generation of our children and grand. No, 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 no. Here's the way it's going to go down. We're all going to be killed. So what impact did their words have on these people? Look at, uh, excuse me, Numbers chapter 14, verse number 1. It said, then the whole community, every last Israelite, 
Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. All of a sudden, morale's gone. And an entire nation is gripped with depression. No celebration here, mourning. Their voices rose in a great protest, a, a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. Look now, man. Not only are they depressed, but the nation is divided. The people are now against the men whom God has appointed to be their leaders. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they, what is that word? Are you seeing it? Complained. Now, some of you are reluctant to say that word out loud. Why was that? Huh? Kind of striking close to home there, isn't it? So they begin to complain and say, you know what would have been best for us? I, I, I wish I'd have just died in that wilderness. <laughs> even better, I wish I had just died in Egypt and never even gone through the wilderness. Oh, man. Look, why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? All of a sudden, they are convinced that God has lied to them. God's the one who's been telling them, I'm going to give you the land. I'll, I'll run out there. I'll do all that for you. You just got to go in and do what I tell you to do. You know what they're convinced of now? He's been lying to us. He brought us out here to have us killed. Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. They're assuming the worst. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? What we need is a complete change of direction. Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. What we need is new leadership who will take us in a new direction. Well, at this, Moses and Aaron hit the ground. I think they were praying. I think they recognized we're in a very dangerous situation. It feels like God's people are about to reject His plan and rebel against Him. So I think they're praying. Joshua and Caleb, on the other hand, felt responsibility to step up and once again try to encourage these people by giving them accurate perspective on the situation. They preached a little brief sermon, and their thesis of the sermon was essentially this, don't forget God. Don't leave God out of this decision. Don't you lose sight of him. This is what he wanted. Therefore, if we don't do it, we're rebelling. We don't want to rebel against him, do we? And, and hey, remember his promise? He promised to give it to us. And he promised that he would fight for us. Therefore, I, I, we, saw, we saw those giants just like these other ten guys. But we're kind of measuring them up against God and against God. They don't seem like so much. They're nothing to him. We can do this. Boy, can you see them kind of close their Bible and back up going, that, that preached. Just watch this. I'm telling you, man, we just hit them with a massive dose of encouragement. Watch this. How did it work? Uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 10, it said, but the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> they said, guys, if you don't shut up, we're going to kill you. Boy, they obviously didn't learn anything in seminary about how to preach and make people feel better about themselves, did they? Huh? <laughs> what happened next? Well, the next thing the Bible said, God showed up. God said, you know, I haven't been invited to this meeting. But I'm inviting myself into this meeting. And he said to Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb, you boys and your crowd... You need to move away from this crowd. Because here's what I'm about to do. I'm about to kill every one of them. I'm going to kill those ten guys. I'm going to kill every one of these people been complaining. Probably, probably about two million people. I'm going to massacre ten, two million people right here, right now, on the spot. Clear a path. I've been kind of studying Moses in my private devotions. And I wrote the other day, he's a better man than me. I mean that. And I'm going to tell you this, it's probably going to hurt your feelings. He's probably a better man than you. You know how he responded to that? I'll tell you how he responded. Having, knowing all he'd gone through with these Israelites at this point, I'd have said to Caleb, Aaron, and Joshua, 
guys, get you some popcorn, get you a cold drink. Let's sit on this rock. I got to see this go down. You know what Moses did? He prayed that God would forgive him. That amazes me. God, will you forgive him? God said, you know, I will. But they're going to pay a big price for the contempt they have treated me with, for their unbelief, for their complaining. He mentioned that, complaining. They're going to pay a price for their complaining. And it's going to be a heavy one. Every person 20 years of age and above who chose to rebel against me today, I'm taking the opportunity off the table permanently. They'll never enter this land. They'll never see it, experience it, enjoy it, benefit from it, ever done. And you're going to tell them to turn around and go back into the wilderness. And there they're going to wander one full year for every day those 12 men were in that land. Once again, you're ready to be amazed with my mathematical ability. That means 40 years, right? 40 years you will wander. And oh yeah, if you're 20 years and under, it means you're going to waste the next 40 years of your life because of them. So Moses turned and he gave the people, good news, you've been forgiven. <laughs> Bad news is you're never going in the land and the rest of you are just going to waste 40 good years of your life because of them. Now the 10 guys are standing there apparently got away with this, scot free. No. The Bible said God struck them with a plague and killed them deader than a hammer. You say, what? What is this great lesson that you were going to share with us from this story? Okay, here it goes. Misused words are powerful. Now that'll bless you, won't it? You glad you got up and came to church for that? Misused words are powerful. All our words are powerful. When we use words as God intends, we release constructive power. God can use those words to build up someone's faith, build up their courage, build up their sense of self-worth. However, words used improperly are also powerful. When we use words as God never intended them, we release destructive power. And just how powerful are misused words? Based on this story alone, we see that the words of ten men, ten men, were powerful enough to destroy the faith of an entire nation. Words turned faith into fear. Words stopped a nation dead in its tracks. Words destroyed the morale of an entire country. Words convinced people that God was a liar. Words stole the courage of a nation and left them paralyzed with discouragement. Words turned a nation against God's appointed leaders. Words turned a nation around and sent it moving in the wrong direction. Words left an entire nation assuming the worst. Words stole the future from an entire generation and stole 40 years of life from another generation. Words turned the focus of a nation off of God and onto their enemies, battles, and problems. Words halted all progress toward a God-given goal. Words convinced an entire nation to say no to God. The misused words of ten men robbed a nation of its morale, faith, courage, unity, and blessings. That's how powerful misused words are. So in light of that little truth, what am I suggesting you do? Two things. Number one, be careful when speaking. Why, you ask? You are influencing someone with your words. When you misuse words by complaining, criticizing, 
griping, backbiting, undermining, blaming, slandering, gossiping, lying, murmuring, muttering, finger pointing, etc. You are unleashing destructive power into someone's life. Your words will either discourage or depress them or both. Your words will rob them of faith and perhaps their future. Misused words destroy reputations, relationships, and churches. And if that's not enough, remember this. Remember that God is listening to every word. And based on God's treatment of the ten, it appears to me that God doesn't take kindly to the misuse of words. So be careful when speaking. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is be careful when listening. Why, you ask Ronnie? Someone is influencing you with their words. Everyone speaking to you isn't speaking for God. You know that, don't you? Everyone offering you advice doesn't have your best interest in mind. There are people sharing their opinion with you who not only don't have faith, they don't even understand the concept of faith. There are people talking with you that won't be happy until you're just as miserable as they are. So, be careful when listening. Ronnie asks, how can I identify a bad influence? Here's one of the things I do. I listen for the but. And I watch for the cut. Let me explain that. People who habitually and intentionally misuse words in the hopes of being an influence a negative influence on you, they have a technique. They have a technique in the way they present these words to you. It goes kind of like this. Here's their outline. Positive, but negative. It always starts off on a positive. They always start off with a word of praise, maybe. Uh, oftentimes, you could actually categorize it as flattery. You say, where are you getting this at? Did you not catch how the ten presented this? They started off with the positive. The land is incredible, wonderful, unbelievable. Positive, but then comes the cut. The people, the cities, all the negatives begin to pile. Up. It's not just these guys. Go read the Gospels. I was noticing the other day that when, when, when the enemies of Jesus would come to him in hopes of discrediting him, they almost always started off by flattering him. Have you ever noticed this? Oh, Jesus, you're an outstanding teacher. A, a teacher sent from God. Wonderful orator. But where do you get off? Claiming to be the son of the living God. It's a technique. So when someone is giving me their advice, they're giving me their counsel, they're talking with me, I listen for that but. When they start off with flattery, with praise, anybody who's trying to mislead you, they can't end a conversation on a positive note. They can't say something good about you or anyone else or anything else and just stop. Why? Because their objective is not to give praise. Their objective is to cut somebody down to size, maybe you, and influence the way you think and therefore hopefully the way you act. You know what the flattery is, don't you? You know what that is, don't you? It's the butter. And they're just buttering up the place on you where they're going to insert the blade. Y'all are looking at me like you have no earthly idea what I'm talking about. Do you? Okay. It's going to go down something like this. Somebody that wants to discourage you or depress you, they'll start off by saying something flattering about you. 
And then they'll go, but. Then comes the criticism. Then comes the cut. If they want you, if they want to turn you against somebody, they'll start off by saying something very flattering about the person that they want you to change, they want to change your attitude about. That's something very flattering. And then comes the but. Then comes the cut. They're going to start laying out all the negatives. If they want to turn you against something, they'll start off by praising whatever that is. Then comes the but. Then comes the cut. They begin to criticize that and tear it down. I, I've been pastoring for a while. I know, I'm, I know I look young. I know you're thinking, he couldn't have pastored very long. I mean, just... Yeah. I cannot tell you how many churches whose names I could call this very morning and tell you they were destroyed by someone using this very technique. It was their objective to become an influence, a negative influence, that was in the end going to cost God's people greatly. Ah, that's one thing I do. Another thing I do is this, I, 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 and it's something I'd encourage you to do. Pay attention to your emotions. If as you're listening to this person, as, as you listen more and more, are you feeling more and more discouraged and more and more depressed? The further you go, you're probably listening to someone who's going to be a bad influence. As you listen to them, do you find yourself growing angrier and angrier toward another person, someone they're talking about? You find yourself getting, you know, your, your attitude toward them is really going south in a hurry. The more you listen, you're listening to the wrong influence. As you listen to this person, is God growing smaller and smaller as your problems grow larger and larger? With each spoken word, do you find your attitude souring? If so, you're listening to a bad influence. Be careful. Their words are releasing destructive power. If you believe what they say, their words are going to rob you of joy, of faith, of courage, of peace, and could potentially rob you of the future that God has planned for you. Don't let a negative person be a negative influence influence on you. Be careful when you're listening. It's only 10.15. Because I got a story to tell. You know, what that, you know what that says to me? You can take all the time you want. When I resigned my first church, a gentleman called me and he invited me to lunch. And he had attended that church through most of my tenure as pastor, but he had left a few months before I announced my resignation. And he said, uh, I want you to come to lunch with me. If you do, I'm going to buy you a, a plate full of barbecue. Well, he had me at barbecue. <laughs> I couldn't turn down barbecue. So I met him at Brushy Creek Barbecue down in the east. I don't even know if it's still open. And so there he had me. You talk about buttering up Ronnie Hodge. Barbecue? So we started eating, and he said, uh, you know, I, I know you know that my family and I left the church several months ago. He said, I want you to know that I'm coming back. I feel that I need to act as an agent, just looking out for the best interest of the church as you depart. You always say, I gotta make sure you don't do something wrong. That you don't take advantage of that church. I never said a word. I, I, to be honest with you, I was completely broken. At this point in my life, I didn't have any fight left in me. I didn't say anything, I just kept eating my barbecue. He said, I also want to say some things to you that. Very few people would have the courage to say to you, but I do. He said, you're an excellent communicator. Flattery, you know, lathering the butter on. You're an excellent communicator. And then he said this, but. He said, you have no business 
serving a local church in the capacity of pastor. You're not cut out for it. He said, for example, you're not a good leader. He said, I think that's been proven. Oh, I never get how smug he was. How arrogant. And he said, I've known you for a long time. You have absolutely no compassion for people. So I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Before you attempt to pass another church, you need to pursue another way to make a living. He said, maybe there's a church out there that would let you be a Sunday school teacher, put you in some capacity where you could do minimal harm. Did it make you mad? No, it didn't make me mad. I didn't try to explain myself, defend myself. Listen to me. He knew he had a broken man down on the ground, and he was taking full advantage. He was like a shark. He smelled blood in the water. He went for it. Now, I have to admit, it did add to my discouragement. It did add to my confusion. It did add to my depression. Matter of fact, I was so depressed, I didn't finish my barbecue. And when Ronnie Hodge don't finish barbecue, he is depressed. I'm telling you, he's depressed. So I got in my truck, and I started home. And I was contemplating those things he said. And I heard this other voice in my head. They said, hey, Ronnie, I'm sitting right there at the table with you and this man. I heard the advice he gave you. What you going to do? Because my colleague conflicts his counsel. Do you understand? I heard his advice, but what have I called you to do? Because I want you to make a decision. Whose words are you going to follow? I said, well, God, I'm going to pursue the calling that you placed on my life a long time ago. And I'm going to keep uh, pastoring churches as long as the church will have me. I'll keep doing this. That's been 24 years ago. Sometimes I think back about that conversation. And when I do, I bow my head in humility and go, thank you, God, that I did not listen to that jack leg. You say you don't say jack leg in your prayers. I want to talk about that man to God, I do. Yeah, I'm so glad. No, I don't. That I didn't listen to him. Oh, what I would have missed out on if I had taken his advice. He wasn't acting as an agent of God, was he? He was acting as an agent of my enemy, trying to discourage me from staying steady on the path God had placed me on and pursuing the future that God had called me to. He was acting as an agent of my enemy, trying to talk me out of everything God had between that moment and this. You know, I've seen him a couple of times since then. And you'd be proud of your pastor. I must have a little bit of compassion for human beings. Because I didn't say to him what I wanted to. (laughs) I treated him with grace and kindness and respect. You know why I got it figured? I don't have to tell him he was wrong. He lived here in Wahala for a long, long time. I believe God, every time he pointed to go to corner church, told him, boy, you missed that one by a mile. By a mile. Listen to me. Missed you's words are powerful. So you be careful when speaking. Your words are influencing somebody. Misused words are powerful. So be careful when listening. Because someone's words are influencing you. Let's pray together. Father, you're going to have to help us here. Because we human beings love to talk. Sometimes with no filter, no wisdom, no self-control, we just talk. 
And the things we say that we would consider harmless, they're not harmless at all. They're devastating. They're destructive. And in many cases, our words are destroying your people. Please help us leave here and be careful. Slow down and think. We don't have to share our opinion every time it pops into our mind. Everybody doesn't have to know everything we're thinking. Help us be careful. And Lord, woven into the fabric of our lives, maybe where we work, maybe an extended family member, maybe in our church, we encounter people, honestly, their intent is no good. They have an agenda. They have their personal agenda. They're eating up with pride, arrogance, anger, jealousy. And Lord, they just work their way through a church looking for a an audience, looking for someone to listen, someone they can sway, hoping to build some kind of following. Lord, help us be careful. Whom we listen to. We need to help us make sure that the advice we're following is advice that's come from you through a human being, through your word, preferably. So help us with this, God. Help us honor you with our words. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.